Well, good afternoon and welcome to the show today. I've got a fascinating guest, uh, a guest that will get you to get yourself out of bed at half past four in the morning, going for a run that you never wanted to go on. I'm really, really excited to have Robert Owens on the show today, having done seven marathons in seven continents in seven days. Uh, if you count all the continents, that includes the icy regions, Antarctica, I'm going to get into that. He's a former USAF pararescueman, think Navy SEALs, only on the rescue side, not on the destruction side. We're going to get into that too. Well, let's get to it. My name's Alex McFell. This is High Performance Teams. Very good morning to you, Robert, all the way from California. Thank you for getting up early before the sun and joining me today. You bet. Good morning. Nice to see you. Hey, that was a nice intro. Uh, I liked looking at the Airbus 340-300. That's what we took around the world. We oh, nice. marathon seven days. Okay. So, yeah, let's, well, you, you brought it up, so let's do it. Is it, a, is it a charter flight then? Is it a whole select crew that all goes in one flight? Um, the first two years was commercial, and then they went to a charter. And so they yeah. got a charter that had all business class seats. So we had oh. 75 business class seats so that everybody could sleep uh, in between runs. Okay, great, great, great. Where does it start? Uh, it started uh, in Cape Town, and everybody uh -huh. meets at the, at the Hyatt there at a hotel. Um, and then we take off from there, go to the airport, we get on 757, and we go to Antarctica. And that's about a five-hour flight. And we okay. land, and we run the runway. So it's real bleak and flat, you know, and so they put up a marker around the runway, and so you do 26.3 miles, 40K <laughs> around the thing. It's about 20 below zero when it starts, and it's about... 30 below zero and about 50 mile an hour winds when, when it's over. And then you wow. get back on that plane. Then they have to get the plane warm again. And that takes a while. <laughs> and then you take off and you go back to Cape Town. And when you land in Cape Town, since this is done in January, summertime, yeah. um, you know, that's a warm day in Antarctica. <laughs> and then you land in Cape Town, it was 90 degrees. And so you get off there and that, that swing from 20 below to 90 above wrecks a lot of guys. And so, uh, you go down to um, viewpoint or season point or is it sea uh, point? Cape, Cape point or sea Cape, point? Sea point. Okay. And where there's lots of uh, properties on the beachfront or is just nature yes. and the wild seas? Okay. No. Sea point. Yes. Yeah. Sea point. And um, they mark out a course along the beach and you run that thing, I think eight times. And okay. you, uh, it's miserable because you start at noon in the hottest part of the day. Uh, Cause everywhere you go, you just, as soon as you land, you go and you run. So no matter what time of day it is, day or night, as soon as you land, you run, take a shower, get back on the plane, fly, land, and start running again. Anyway, it was an interesting Cape Town run. They were doing construction <laughs> and <it> was jackhammers <laughs> and trucks, and you're running around all kinds of things. Anyway, um, from Cape Town, you do that. Then you get on a plane, go to Perth, Australia, and that's okay. a nice 11-hour flight. And the challenge is, is that when you do the first two, you got to do the first two in one day. So the world record is that you have to finish all seven marathons within seven 24-hour periods. And because yeah. of weather and travel restrictions, uh, immigration, sometimes you get delays. So they want to knock out two in the first day. Actually, you knock out two in the first 20 hours. <laughs> and then, then you get your first flight, you get your first shower. Um, and then you go to Perth and you wake up in Perth and you run Perth. And that's the first of four night marathons. So we land... Uh, eat a little bit, and then we start running in the dark, and you run till about 2 or 3 in the morning, and then you go take a shower, and you get back on that plane, you fly to Dubai, and that's another night one, and so you land out in the middle of this dirt desert, you know, and they take you down by the ocean, and you run, and it's a bizarre deal, and then you get off of Dubai, and you then take off to Europe. When you go to Europe, it's cold. It's January, so it's raining and sleeting, and you run cobblestones in Lisbon, uh, Portugal. And so you run this crazy thing on wood slats and, co and, and cobblestones and streets. And anyway, you get done. And all of these, when you done, when you get done, there's no one there to say, good job. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's one guy there that takes a clicker, you know, and marks you, okay, you did it. See you go over there. <laughs> so you high five yourself, you know, and you, Hey, you did a good job. You talk to yourself. And you're the audience of one. You go back to the hotel, you get a shower, and then you get on the plane again and fly to Cartagena, Colombia. And that's a good flight because you get some, some sleep again. Yeah. You wake up then in the tropics, you know, like the equator, and it's 90 yeah. and humid, 
you get out there and you land and you start running at night again and you run till two or three in the morning. And um, that's, that was bizarre. Anyway, then you get on a plane. You, by that time, you're so tired that when you get mm -hmm. done, you go back to the hotel for your shower and all the guys are awake and no one's going to sleep. They say, screw it. We don't, we won't go to bed tonight. We'll just, we'll just stay up and run tomorrow because you got to get on a plane and go to Miami and that's uh, only a two hour flight. So okay. there's no sleep. You just take off and go and land. As soon as you land, you have to run again. So you just by that time, it's all adrenaline. And you just sure. land in Miami and you start running at noon in the heat. And you finish mm -hmm. that one off. And you got to get it done within those seven 24-hour periods. And um, there's all different kinds of runners. We had 50 uh, runners, 35 men, 15 women. We had okay. the three-hour guys, the four-hour guys, the five-hour marathoners, the six-hour marathoners. And uh, two, two years ago, if you can imagine, we had five guys do marathons seven in a row under three hours. Yeah. Can you imagine such a thing? We had some yeah. Olympians show up, you know, and they wanted to see if they could break the world record. So five yeah. sub three hour marathon or seven sub three marathons in a row. That's anyway, right. wow. it's, it's a crazy thing. They had a party that night at the very end. And they told everybody to go get a shower, and no one showed up for the party because they all fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> that hot shower, you're finally relaxing. You just lie on your bed for just one minute, and three days later, you wake up. <laughs> one minute, one minute, boom. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. That sounds incredible. So with an intro like that, we can go anywhere from here, and that's amazing. So, wow, Robert, thank you, thank you. That's uh, an incredible thing. So Craig's joining us on LinkedIn, and he's saying, how many athletes started? So you said there's 50 athletes. And, uh, and then obviously 25 support staff to fill this, um, this uh, Airbus. Uh, wow, that's, that's an incredible journey and uh, not an easy thing to be a part of. So I'd imagine you know, this, it's quite a complex exercise to, to set up and to facilitate. And um, you would never have thought such an extreme challenge would result in no big finish line fanfare. But there you go. It's a Lisbon, it, uh, it hits you that you, <laughs> you're on your own on this thing. You wanted to do it, not me. <laughs> yeah, when, I, when, you, when you finish in Miami, there's a lot of people there. Because family sure. and friends fly in from all over the world, and yeah. uh, the the mayor and all these officials, you know, they're, they're saying we want to see these stupid people that really did this thing. You yeah. know, it's, it's fun. And then tell me, of the fifty that started, how many finish? Uh, weak percentage? All finished, but one. Okay. One guy got really, really sick in Cape Town. Oh, um, no. He got sick in Cape Town, and then he got worse in Perth, and he passed out on the yeah. course, and they took him oh, off yeah. the course in Dubai. Uh, he was sick uh, for the next three months. Something bit him, you know, in Cape Town or before Cape Town, but it, it knocked him out for a long time. So it wasn't just a, a virus or a flu. It was something that was pretty severe mm -hmm. that bit him. Okay. And, and being that it's a, such an elite event and it's such a small group and, it, you know, it's an intense thing to train for and, and actually complete, I would imagine there was a sense of camaraderie. Have you kept in contact? Is there a bit of a group of you that did this together, the 777 Club that you keep contact with? Yes. There's a world marathon challenge uh club group and there's okay. all kinds of people posting what they're doing now um, okay. some people go on and then go to the north pole marathon so you do both poles and then the seven continents and there's there's a special club for that but people are always okay. doing different stuff around the world crazy things there's some crazy people out there well robert that's amazing and uh and it's a, it's a great intro and thank you but i want to peel back a few years and listen to a couple of your interviews recently and uh, the bit that caught my attention, which is the, a bit that I want to share with, with people that are listening in, and for my benefit, is there was a time in your life as a sort of a youth, or even before that, so you were adopted very young, an infant, you know, not even six months, not even sitting, walking, etc. but you also had um, your own disabilities with your feet and your knees and ankles. So let me just share that, that sort of very young experience about being the last guy to be selected or never selected for the softball team or the, the soccer team. You know, I think all of us have stories and all of us have families and issues of different types. Um, being a, a special needs baby and being adopted was one thing. Um, going to school as a little kid and not being able to play with your friends, not being able to run around, um, it was real frustrating and it messed with my head. You know, like, hey, mm -hmm. I want to play. Well, no one wants you to play because you can't keep up. And mm -hmm. so... Um, it was difficult to be a little kid and be watching everybody else play. And I think yeah. probably my dysfunction started early because <laughs> <laughs> I was going to make a comeback and show people that I could play, you know. And mm -hmm. so 
I'm sure that we get wired with different things when we're young. And um, I remember those days of saying, someday I'm going to play and I'm going to do what they do. And I'm going to win. And, um, and I'm sure of my subconscious, that's down there somewhere. And if you, if you, when you're biting down on that 600th push up or sit up or jackknife or whatever it is you're doing and you're gritting your teeth through it, are those the thoughts I'm going to show you I'm going to play? Or, or is it played through already by then that you've got just, just 10 more seconds? Just curious, do those thoughts reappear today? No, those, those thoughts maybe have matured. <laughs> and those, those thoughts today are, um, you tell me I'm too old? Really? <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> you know, and so I, I don't like to be told that I'm too old. And I don't like to be told that I'm not that good or don't try. And, so, you know, there are certain things that get under my skin. Like I did my I, I didn't do an Ironman for 20 years. And then my mm. son at my 50th birthday said, God, Dad, you're really old. I mean, like, uh, you're really old. And he was just being a punk. You know, he's like 12 years old or something like that, you know. And I said, really, am I really old? He goes, I mean, you're half a century. I mean, you might as well shoot yourself. You know? <laughs> and I, I said, really? And so I said, okay, um, watch this. So I began to train for that Ironman. You know, I hadn't done it in 20 years. And I thought, I wonder if I can still do that thing. <laughs> and anyway, I made him sit at the finish line. And um, actually, all my kids had to sit at the finish line because you see such spectacular things at the finish line. You see people crawling across. You mm -hmm. see the blind. You see the one-legged. You see the no legs. You see, you see every kind of person that should have an excuse that they should not be having to do this come across yeah. the finish line. And at the end, you know, I turn to my kids and I say, "So what's your excuse? We don't have excuses. If these folks mm -hmm. can do this, then you're able-bodied. You can do anything. You're smart. You're capable. You're gifted." And so I don't want to hear about any excuses in your life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, Dad. And then I made them sit at a lot of finish lines. And I made them have, write a paper for their class at school. You know, this is what I saw. And they'd have to go back and talk about people crawling across the finish line or passing out the finish line. And all the different size men, women, stuff, you know. And, and it really affected my kids. Like, wow, you know, we, we should not have a lot of excuses in life. So yeah, I just didn't like my son saying that. <laughs> sure. Now, I made a note of, of finish line because I want to come back to that. Uh, I want to just then uh, fast forward. So, so that was your sort of junior school years. Fast forward to now finishing school and, you, you, you know, you got stronger and fitter. You spent a lot of time at the beach, surf. I also grew up at the coast and, and life saving, etc. A lot of fun times. You just naturally feel healthy and strong and fit. And, and that's where you're exposed to, for the first time, uh, not where it started, to uh, Navy SEALs coming up and down the beach talking to you and, and a USAF pararescue coming talking to you and saying, hey, we're looking for, for, for water guys. Um, just, I would like you to, sh you to share your thoughts about that stage in your life, maybe 16, 17, 18, where you, you're kind of getting confidence, you're fit and strong, you've got a groove in the water, you know, you've been a, a good lifesaver. You're seeing these, what are potentially role models, but you're not listening to them because you're, again, you, you, you take a different path and you, you know, get into drugs and, the, and stuck with the law and end up with that uh, serious injury getting burnt in a, doing a dare challenge over the fire. So I, just want to sh I would like you to share, please, your, your thoughts and your sort of frame of mind at the time when those, that sort of part of your life was going on? You know, before we were on the air, you asked if everything was uh, open to talk about. And I probably ought to go back a little bit. Um, okay. You know, in junior high, I got uh, sexually assaulted twice. And one was at a Boy Scout camp and one was with a neighbor. And okay. it, spent, it wrecked my head. Um, my mom was dying, she had lupus. And back then, um, you didn't have a cure for lupus. so. I'm the special needs kid. And then my mom gets really sick and she was my best friend. And she taught me everything because she was a physical education major in university. And so she was the jock that sort of got me going in everything. Anyway, when she started to die and she didn't, she died, but they got her back and she was fighting lupus for 40 years. Um, it was just a tough time watching your mom be sick and you've got mm. issues and then you get sexually assaulted. And, um, I just didn't handle the pressure well. Like lots of kids, um, they have issues. There's things in their families and stuff. So I, I then got into water polo and swimming and became that beach lifeguard. And when I became the beach lifeguard, that was a huge win for me because my family was very academic. My father was a, a straight A college university 
guy and um, never got a B in his life. My mom was a straight A UCLA um, physical education major. My sister was a 4.0 straight A at USC. And then there was me and I didn't really like academics. Plus I didn't think I was very smart. And so when I finally, and the story of the lifeguard is huge because when I, when I got to high school, I had a coach who said, Robert, you know, all these kids have been swimming long time before you. They start swimming at six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old. You're coming in at 13 and trying to compete with the age group swimmers. And he mm -hmm. said, you're not any good, but you have talent. And he said, hard work can be better talent. If you can focus on your hard work and not worry about who you're competing against, you can see that you'll rise up and do what others thought they could do, but they don't do. And so when I became that beach lifeguard, that was a win for me because I did it under age and I did it, uh, became the first 15 and a half year old ever hired by the city. And, but then that summer I had a kid die in my arms and he was surfing and you know, the term, the board, a long board purled and shot back and hit him in the sternum and severed his aorta in half. And so he was standing up in the ocean. I looked at, I put my binoculars on him and he's waving, you know, with his eyes open. And he says, I'm dying, I'm dying. And so I call for backup and I run down with my orange buoy, you know, and I say, what's up? And he's standing in the ocean, he's dying. He going, hey, I'm dying, I'm dying. I said, no, you're not, you're looking good. He goes, no, I'm dying. Anyway, I saw blood in the water and I grabbed him and I got him out and uh, got him up on the beach and he bled out my arms. He was only about 16 years old himself. And that, yeah. uh, that aorta, every time he pumped his heart, it was pumping blood into his stomach cavity because his, his aorta was um, severed. Anyway, it was a traumatic thing. And back then you didn't process that. It was like the next day when I went to school, they said, did you get your homework done? You know, I said, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I didn't get it done. Why not? You know, I had a kid die in my arms yesterday. I was not doing real good. Well, that doesn't matter. Just do your homework, you know? And then mm -hmm. I, the next year I had another lady die on me. And so... Oh. She got washed off the rocks and I had to go look for her and found her up under a rock. And she was all beat up and dead by the time I got to her. So in my first two years at 15 and a half and 16 and a half, I had two people die. And I ended up drinking. I ended up just drinking a lot because I just had stuff piled from when I was a little kid, my mom, the abuse, blah, blah, blah. And then I didn't know how to process anything. And back in those days, we didn't talk much. You know, it's just like, go do your deal, you know? So when I started drinking, I, I, I drank um, all the time and uh, it was wrecking me. And that's when you talk about, the, you know, we had a beach lifeguard party with a bunch of girls, you know, and the guys were showing off. And so we were skinny dipping and some guy said, let's jump a bonfire. <laughs> and the big black smoke is just billowing up. And anyway, um, I was stupid enough and drank enough that I jumped to do this thing. But I didn't I couldn't see across the fire that another guy was jumping at the same time. And we landed in the middle. And I fell down, he laid on top of me, on top of the coals. And so mm -hmm. I'm now sizzling on this fire and I have to wait for him to get off before I can get up. And then to get up, I had to stick my arm in the coals and push myself off. And uh, so I was burned all over and both arms. And at that time I was rowing crew, the big long boats, you know, you see in the Olympics. I was on the crew team at my university. And of course I couldn't hold the oars anymore. I was all wrapped up with bandages and, and uh, it was a mess. Anyway, some people said to me, hey, Robert, you're out of control. Um, you're screwed up. Um, you think you're having fun, but you're not going to live much longer. I mean, you just do stupid things. And these, there were some lifeguard guys who were pararescuemen. Uh, in the U.S., we have reservists. And the reservists, they only work uh, two weeks a summer, and then one weekend a month they do their stuff. And so they said, why don't you come be a pararescuemen with us? You got talent. And I said, I don't have that kind of talent. I'm not that smart, not that gifted. I'm not that, I'm not that together. I'm not that good of an athlete. They, then they said again to me, they said, if you'll do what we say, and if you'll just focus, if you'll go dark, like no chicks, no drinking, no weed, no partying. If you'll just focus and train the way we tell you to train, you can do that. And I thought if, if you believe that I can do that, I'll believe in your belief because I don't know that I can do that because my self-worth yeah. wasn't that strong that I thought, oh, yeah, I can knock that out. I, I just didn't think I could. So I did exactly what they said. 
and I, I went dark. I said goodbye to all my friends. My, my parents were, were not for me joining the military. My girlfriend was not for me joining the military, but I knew I needed to make a change in life. And there's a time in your life and to the people listening, whether it's drugs or alcohol or whatever, there's times when you have to make a decision to grow up and get your act together and stop having excuses for why you are the way you are. And I had one of those epiphany moments where I knew this was a time for me to change my life. And so mm -hmm. I, want, I, I wanted to get clean. I wanted to grow up. I wanted to be mature. I, I wanted to stop being a stupid kid. And so I did what they said and I enlisted and I went in. And for the viewers in the, in the United States, we have four major branches, you know, Air Force, Army, Marines, and, and uh, Navy. And the first three are, are all offense. Navy, Marines, and Army are offensive. But the special ops of the Air Force is defense. And it's to rescue those three when they get in trouble. So we're combat paramedics who parachute in with our drugs and our needles and our knives and a, a, a gun or an Uzi. And you, you fight your way in and you rescue guys that are hurt, Navy SEALs, and then you, it's your job to get them out, to rescue and get them out. So if you like beach lifeguarding or snow uh, ski, uh, ski patrol, I was a ski patrol guy. If you like rescue, you, the, the highest level of rescue you can get to in the world is to be a pararescueman. And we then get assigned to the Army or get assigned to the Navy or get assigned to the Marines or assigned to SAS or something because we're a specialty. We can be assigned to any group because we're a complement because it's our job to make sure that they get out if something happens to them. So we worked by ourselves. When I was in, there was only 200 of us, but there were 3,000 Navy SEALs because we worked by ourselves. We worked, we, where's the problem? Jump in, fix it, get out. <clears throat> so when I went in, um, it was a big challenge. And fortunately, out of the 150 guys that were in my class, and usually in a Navy SEAL class or a, a Air Force Special Warfare class, they start with about 150 kids. And um, anyway, about seven of us graduated nine months later uh, and 16 total where we had rollbacks from other classes who had been injured, who once they got well, got assigned to our class. And then they made me team leader of all things. And <laughs> so I went, uh, we're all the good guys and all the good guys had quit. The, the, the really athletic, gifted guys had not trained for that type of mental pressure. And therefore, when it got too tough, when an instructor would come and put his nose on your nose and say, I'm going to crush you. Do you understand me? Um, it wigged them out. They, they freaked out and just, they found a reason to quit. And so when the, the seven of us of our original class were standing there at the end, we were just amazed that we were the ones that ended up making it. And the point was, if you focus and if you train correctly, you can do better than talent. You, you can beat better talent. You can, you can outlast others who mentally are not capable or don't know how to stay in the game for that length of time. And so that was a huge win. Again, for me, growing up, I stopped drinking. I stopped partying. I stopped everything. And I focused. I became a paramedic. And um, I loved jumping out of planes and rescuing people. And, and putting people in body bags and getting them out. So that, that was a that was a win for me. I'll, that, I'll let you amazing. ask a question or something. <laughs> that was a, an amazing intro. You, you brought in, you, you've answered some of my questions already, but I do want to just zoom in on a couple of stuff there. Firstly, I'm very excited to, to have in common with you also having served my Air Force uh, 10 years in the South African Air Force, and it's great to have it in common. You know, we can, we can have a dig at the Navy people out there because we are Air Force. <laughs> so, um, and we have a similar thing in South Africa too, the, uh, the special operations for the, the medics. We call it the ops medics, same kind of thing, jumping into the hot zones and rescuing people. But I want to just highlight, in, in case the point wasn't made properly, that uh, being part of the, the Navy SEALs, uh, going on operations, I mean, on deployments, you're the one of the 300 or however many there are. The, in order to be that good and get through pararescue, I want to highlight that it's the equivalent of getting through Navy SEAL training, except they add on the combat side of things, and for you they add on the medical, you know, the, the um, CPR would be the basic stuff, but obviously you've got two or three years of that training. So I want to just stress the point that it is no mean feat to just get in and, and become pararescue, uh, although it's not talked about as much, certainly the media makes and, and movies make 
very big noise about the Navy SEALs and everyone knows about Jocko Willink and uh, those kind of people, David Goggins. But Pararescue doesn't seem to get the same glint in the media, although it is the same kind of requirement to get in and, uh, and training course to get through. Well, you know, this, this is my, my little fun point. You know, Goggins is my, is my guy. And, I, you know, some people occasionally say, hey, you're just an old Goggins. You know, I go, <laughs> I, I just laugh, you know. But the fun part is, remember, in David Goggins' story, he tried out for Pararescue and he failed. Uh, and I that's didn't know that. what, yeah. <laughs> so he first of all, his first thing he tried ever was to be a pararescueman, and he didn't make it. He quit, and so uh -huh. that's when he went back and became that that termite guy and spraying cockroaches. And then mm -hmm. he gained all that weight. Then he came back and said, "I'm going to try to be a Navy SEAL." So the, <laughs> the fun part was, you know, I I would say to David, "Hey, David, you're a stud, but but you didn't make pararescue." <laughs> <laughs> And that's great, yeah. The, 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 the healthy banter between the arms of service, we're talking about special operations. We both can deploy to Iraq or wherever, but uh, remember, I'm doing the rescue, right? <laughs> You're going blowing things up. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Robert, uh, um, yeah, I want to come back to a few things, but you mentioned again, and this goes back to my Air Force days, hard work and outdo talent. As a flying instructor, I can remember clearly talking to my students because it's funny how you see your students, uh, you see things in yourself in some of the students you come through. I had probably 10 different uh, student pilots along the way teaching them to fly. And uh, I had one, uh, one pairing where there were two different students and they were briefed together sometimes. One was supremely naturally talented and he could just cruise through. And the other one had to work a bit harder, but ultimately they ended in a similar place. And I can remember saying to the person that needed to work a bit harder, just remember, you know, you just keep working and, and things will come right and put in the effort and get, you know, put your shoulder down and work. And to the other one who I saw a lot of myself and it, you know, just cruising through with sort of natural ability and, uh, you know, if things come to you easily, well, then don't put in the effort because it's coming to you. So just, just ride that wave. And I can remember saying, you better watch out. You are taking it easy. And by the end of this, you're going to get a surprise because you, because it comes easily, you take it easy and therefore you're going to, you're going to get a surprise at the finish line. So that you know, is a, yeah. you know it's, it's so true. The really talented people that have cruised, it's become easy to them. When their world gets rocked, they don't know who they are. Because who am I now? I've always been tremendous. I've always been gifted. I've always been Olympic talent or super smart. And the instructors look for that because they want to find the, the way to crush that ego and then find out that person can pick themselves up and start again. And most cannot do that. They're too fragile mentally. So mm. you take a kid who's been real scrappy all of his life, not quite as good as everybody else and always fighting to make first team or always fighting, you know, to make weight wrestling or whatever it may be. Uh, he's used to fighting and being, as we say, scrappy and have grit. And so mm. he likes the fight. He likes the, the competition. But the really smart, gifted kids, they don't know what to do when they get to World Rock. And we see that all the time. Um, the really gifted ones come in and you look at them, they're just physically and mentally specimens. And then we get in their head and they just, they collapse like cards. And uh, it's yeah. real sad. Yeah. Oh, I want to get to that because we're going to come to uh, Sealfit and Kokoro just now, but also want to bring in some of the listeners. So my dad's joining us. Thanks for joining dad. And he's saying a uh, fascinating conversation. And uh, <laughs> Rod, right, I spoke with him earlier today saying, I've got a, a gentleman coming on who's in your vintage and he was going swimming. And I said, how many times a week are you swimming? He said, oh, two or three times. I said, oh, well, the guy I'm uh, talking to today, he, <laughs> he, he might outrun you, so maybe you want to up your game. And just in the preparation for this uh, show in the last few weeks, I've noticed that in myself, you know, I'm thinking to myself, well, if Robert is training and can do seven marathons in 70 days and he's nearly 70, uh, in seven days, nearly 70 years old, surely I can run every day just a 5K. So I've been running more because I know that I was coming to talk to you today. Tasha is joining us too. You're saying you rock my world. Um, I'm presuming <laughs> that's for you, Robert, not for me. <laughs> well done, Nate. Let me just and let me just say to let me just say to some of your folks. Remember, yeah. the best advice I got was um, being adopted with no medical history. In my 20s, I was told the best thing I can do is to stay healthy and in physically shape in physical shape because the best health, best health insurance is to be able to fight off disease and illness when it comes. And so mm -hmm. if you'll stay physically fit and healthy, you'll have a better chance when things come at you. And so I've always used that as a backup that if I stay, if I stay healthy, odds are like this year when I had COVID, you know, 
uh, when that thing hit me, I said, oh, okay, let's ride this thing, you know, let's have another adventure. And sure enough, the doc said, because you and your wife are physically fit with no pre-existing conditions, that thing bounced off you. It didn't kill you, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was just grateful that I was in a place physically where my body was strong and able to fight with antibodies. And there's a lot of folks that I know that were super sick because they don't take care of their car. You know, they never change the oil. You know, they never rotate the tires. You know, they, yeah. they just think they'll drive that thing and the red light hits on the dashboard. They take a hammer and go, I don't care. And they just keep driving. Then they want to know why their body breaks down because they've not mm -hmm. taken care of the gift that God's given it. So it's, it's important not just to be athletic, but to see physically fit and invest in your health because you want to live a long life and be able to enjoy your grandkids. And most of many of my friends, you know, I've buried over 50 guys and none of them expected to die. And, you know, I'd say, and I know some of them, when they got to heaven, God probably said to them, what are you doing here? I didn't call you. You tore up your car and it broke down and now you're here in front of me. You aren't supposed to be here, but you, you didn't live right. You're fat and you're, you know, you're obese and you blood pressure and diabetes and heart disease and all the stuff you allowed to happen. So I say to your listeners, from, from an old guy, from a grandfather, um, don't just try to, you know, be a stud. Be smart and be healthy so that your body can age correctly. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you. And Andre also joining us saying, hi, Robert, thanks for sharing the pain that you went through. And this brings me to my question as well. Man, you remind me of some of the people I look up to in this world. Do you think people these days need to ditch the macho persona and start talking more about their individual pain and ask for help, personal and professional? Uh, before you answer that, uh, talking about the macho persona, it, my, the, my question to you earlier was then, you, you spoke about having to try and deal with it and you turned to drinking. What would you advise your 16-year-old grandson now or, or, or think about you if you could sit back and look at your 16-year-old self who started drinking and the teacher said, you know, why haven't you done your homework but your mom's dying and you, uh, you've had people die in your arms on the beach and you were molested, etc. What do you say to that person now that they can deal with it in a better way than the, what, what presented itself for you? Um, a smart person will find someone to talk to. Um, if you can process your stuff, you can work through it. And to Andre's question, um, well, actually to, to any kid first, uh, I, when I, when I work with kids, I mean, I've been training kids and work with kids for a long time. When I see something in them, I say, what's the deal with you? You know, why are you out? What do you like? Or like that? And why are you screwed up? And what's your issues? And most of them don't want to tell me, but but then I'll say, come on, open up. You got talent, you're gifted, you're smart. Why are you, why are you doing what you're doing? And they, when they open up and talk, they can process that pain and they can process the systems and the issues. And here's just a thought. And to Andre's question, um, strong people can work on their stuff and ask for help mm -hmm. because their persona is not being this super stud, I got it all together. The people who have it, um, that are always so proud and, and full of pride and so uh, I'm so cool, they're the most insecure. And so what we teach is this, there's a coin and this coin has two sides. And we, here's my coin, coin here, two sides. And the more pride that I see on a guy, more ego and pride outwardly, I know the more insecure he is on the inside, the more bling, the more needing to be stroked, the more needing to be center of attention. Those people are the most insecure. And mm. so Mark Devine and I from Seal Fit, when we did our podcast together uh, on Unbeatable Mind, we got into guys, the Navy SEAL guys that are a mess uh, and the Marines and the Army and the Air Force guys are a mess because they come back and they can't. They're, they're, they're not strong enough to ask for help. But the guys that do the best are the guys who know who they are. They know they have issues. They know they need to work on them. And they go and they ask for help because they're strong because it doesn't, it doesn't affect their manhood to say, I got issues. When someone tells me they don't have issues, I know that they're messed up. Because everybody, everybody in the world, you know, there's no perfect person. There's no mm. perfect family. There's no perfect situation so when a person says yeah i'm all together i go the guy's in denial <laughs> or he's just being kind at the moment but mm. 
you could tell when a person says, yeah, I've got this issue. I worked on that. I got this and that. Whoa, the guy's uh, matured and worked through stuff and worked through difficult things. And I say to all of you that are listening, um, I, would, I would tell you this. Either you work on your issues or your issues will work on you. And someday mm -hmm. you'll get tired of your issues, whatever they are, working on you. And you'll finally say, and I, I, I say it this way, I have five kids. So I did diapers for 12 straight years. Do you call them diapers? I forgot. Over in South Africa, you call them, well, you call them? nappies. nappies, nappies. Diapers, yeah. <laughs> so I did, I did nappies for 12 straight years, you know. And I yeah. thought it was pretty normal to lift up my kids' legs and wipe their butt, you know, and change their nappy, right? But if you see a 20-year-old wearing a nappy, you'd say, hey, dude, why don't you change your pants, man? And yeah. he'd say, what pants? What's the problem? Well, that rash that you have, that attitude, you know, that, that the way you do this and do that, you need to grow up and deal with your stuff. And so I see some people, you know, in their 20s, 30s, 40s who have never dealt with their stuff, 50s. Mm. You know, and then they become the victim. I am the way I am because this happened to me. We'll get over it. You know, mm -hmm. everybody's, everybody has stuff. And you either choose to work on your issues or you blame your parents or you're, you blame this, or you blame that. And you never grow because maturity is the acceptance of responsibility. And some young people are more mature at 70, 17 than others have been at 70 because they've, they've worked on their stuff. So yeah. for your listeners, um, have courage and go find someone and say, hey, I need to talk. I've never really talked about this or that, and it's wrecking me. I'm overweight, I'm underweight, anorexic, I'm this, I have I'm depression, anxiety, panic attacks. But why? Let's work on our stuff. And then you can get free. And the goal is to be free. You know, you should, with liberty and justice for all, you, everybody can be free if you want to be, but you got to grow up. Yeah. Okay. Well, so some of the notes that I made before we, we, uh, we kicked off, was to talk about this thing about excuses. Some of the other interviews I've heard you talk specifically about excuses. And then you brought in the story about your kids at the finish line. Those people have a reason to have an excuse and they don't. And, uh, and I loved how direct you were to the, a previous uh, host saying, you know, you don't have an excuse. You're just lazy. You, you, the reason you're not fit is because you're lazy. I, I want you to just uh, share your thoughts and, and how you can be so clinical when, uh, when people will say, look, uh, I'm battling and I'm struggling. Um, and, and, and what I suspect you'll say is you need to step up. You need to try a bit harder. You know, um, and, you know, this is a Goggins thing and it's, it's our thing. Um, life is in overcoming. Mm -hmm. And most people don't want to struggle. And life is a struggle. It's not easy. And so we teach you need to every day do something that you don't want to do. You need to struggle. You need to take yourself on. You need to embrace the suck of what's going on in your head and overcome yourself. Learn to do the things that are good for you versus the things that just feel good at the moment. Yeah. And so most people don't want to be called on the carpet like, um, you know, I'm doing this or I'm doing that. Well, why? Um, I don't know. I just, well, why don't you deal with it and grow up? Well, I don't know. And so we say, if you want to mature, if you, if you want to win the mind battle, because every day there's a mind battle. I do, I don't. I will, I won't. Maybe today, mm -hmm. maybe later on today. Every day is a battle. I wrestle with my mind every day. I wrestle with laziness every day. And I've learned that if I'll do something difficult every day that I don't want to do, but it's good for me, at the end of the day, I've gotten a win because I wrestled with myself and I won. Mm. And so whether it's, can you go from 20 cigarettes a day to 18? Can you say no to that donut today and only eat them three times a week? You know, can you, can you do something that you don't want to do and do it because it's good for you? You'll grow up. And yeah. maturity happens when you learn to take yourself on. And so mm. I want the listener to know that I appreciate life, but to be a winner, you have to win. And to be an overcomer, you have to overcome. And that means you embrace a discipline of taking yourself, your flesh on and saying no 
so that you can have a yes later on in the day. And uh, the, the thing it's a day that I, that's great. But what I want to throw back straight away is it's easy for you, for, for me and, and you know, regular folk and, and your average guy, your book, average guy, we talk about that now, but it's easy for us to look at someone who's achieved so much, you know, US Pararescue, uh, Kokora Challenge, 777 Challenge, uh, Sparta Games. Yeah, I mean, you're very well accomplished uh, physically and mentally on, on all these challenges. And so when, when I say, yes, I'm battling with laziness, I think that you don't battle with laziness, but practically, Tell me, when you wake up in the morning, what is it that you battle with, with laziness? Like, how does it feel to you? Because I wake up some days, my alarm snooze three times, 45 minutes after I wanted to get up, and I just think it's just too windy for me to go for a run now. How do you, how, practically, how do you battle with lazy, laziness? Because I, I think that we battle differently. And mine, is, mine is a harder battle than yours because you're so accomplished. Is that true? Um, I don't think I'm that accomplished. I, I appreciate what you're saying. Um, <laughs> I don't, it, the battle is not the laziness. The battle is the mind. The decision, yes, yes. Every morning when I wake up, I have a choice to live by my convictions or to live by my feelings. So this morning when my alarm went off to come be with you, while these <laughs> circles are under my eyes because it's early here, sun hasn't come up yet. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, no problem. But when I when I, that alarm went off this morning, I had the same thing. The thing was, I just lay here five more minutes. And so then I said to myself, are you going to do that again? And I had to start wrestling with my mind. And so there are ways that you can take on your mind. And when you take on your mind and break out of the negative and move it to the positive, you'll naturally begin to do the things that are positive versus negative because you've learned to rewire your brain to think right. And so usually in the morning, what I do is the first thing I do is I start doing some deep nasal breathing. Mm. And it's a technique because to shut off the negative dialogue that's in my head, which is don't get out of bed, stay in bed, you don't want to run today. I have all those thoughts every day, just like everybody else. And so to stop thinking that ticker tape that's running across my head, there's a technique and it's deep nasal breathing through the nose. And I do that in athletics because you get a different kind of oxygen in your lungs when you breathe through your nose than through your mouth. That's a whole other topic. But if you'll do deep nasal breathing, hold it. You can't think anything but about the breathing that you're doing. Mm. So when you, when you do that deep nasal breathing, I'm telling myself I'm rebooting my brain because I can't think two thoughts at the same time. I can either think I want to lay in bed or I can think this is really hard to do this deep nasal breathing. And when I, when I do the deep nasal breathing as a mental reboot, I'm telling myself my mind sucks. I don't want to think those thoughts. I want to think my thoughts, not those thoughts. And I'm going yeah. to take my mind on and break that ticker tape because then I say, I know what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to stop thinking and feeling those thoughts that want to make me less. I need to get out of bed and do what I need to do. Then when I start normal breathing again, I've told myself, now reboot your brain. And so I have a mind gym as much as a physical gym. And mm. every day I've had to learn, and we teach our Navy SEAL and our Air Force Special Warfare guys this technique because we're trying to raise emotionally mature young people versus immature emotional young people. We don't mm. need more immature people. We're, we can't send you into combat immature. You're going to have to make mature decisions that save people's lives or take people's lives. And so... You cannot be a, we cannot allow you to be an immature young person with an Uzi in your hand. You'll yeah. do stupid things. So we have to teach you how to get out of emotional immaturity. I don't want to do it. I'm lazy. That's how I feel. If you feel like it, you'll kill somebody. If you feel so, you'll make a mistake. You won't go down your checklist on the jet. You know, you'll do stupid things. So do your checklist, get emotionally mature and do the little things, break that thing teach yourself how to do what's right, then everything in your life begins to change. Because 
then the thoughts that come to your brain are not just any thoughts that come from other people or a TV show or reading a book, mm -hmm. but they're the thoughts that you've, you've reprogrammed your mind, your neuroplasticity. You can rewire your brain to think the thoughts that you want versus the thoughts that just live in your head. And no. we teach young people, we're going to change your brain. I don't care your mother, your father, what kind of family you were raised in. That's not going to work here. If you're going to work with us, you're going to change your thinking and we're going to rewire that brain of yours. And they go, they look at us and then we do it. And so laziness is just one of the issues that we deal with. So it's that mind control, that, uh, that sort of winning that mental battle. And, and, and again, you know, it really has been inspirational just knowing that I'm going to be talking to you. The other night I went to bed and I, and I just had a strong feeling because of uh, the type of weather that's around here, this part of the world at this time of the year. I knew going to bed that there's a good chance it's going to be raining. And I said to myself, as a last thoughts as I go to sleep, it doesn't matter if it's snowing or sleeting or hailing tomorrow morning. You're getting up, you're putting on your tackies and you're going for a run. Your, your trainers, your, your sneakers, and you're going for a run. And, and that the next morning, <laughs> sure enough, it was miserable. The rain was coming sideways, needles in your eyes, you know, within the first 10 minutes, soaking wet. And, uh, and uh, every step along the way, embrace the suck, enjoy it. And I came back feeling wonderful. And it was uh, amazing. You know, it was one of those win the mornings, Goggins' uh, statement, just win the morning. He also, he runs every morning too, and he doesn't want to. But it's, it's just that, that message for people to say, it's not just you that has that battle every morning. It's everyone. Olympic athletes have that same battle every morning. They don't want to yes. get up at 4.30 and go running when it's freezing outside, but they do it to get to the results that they're looking for. Well, so the, these, the, the, yeah. the key there is you have to have a why that's strong mm -hmm. enough. You know, you can't do it just because, well, I think I'll do it. There's got to be something that's, that's captured you that I want to grow up or I want to change or I want to win at life or I want whatever that want is that you have to have a why. Why do you want to do it? Because that why is going to be tested. Well, it's raining today. I guess I don't want to do it. There's my excuse. No, I want to win today and I mm -hmm. want to defeat me, the, that, that other person that lives inside me. And so I'm going to take myself on. And so the way I'm going to take myself on is I'm going to run or whatever it is you choose to do. Mm. And so the game is not just the physical activity. The game is to do something that you wrestle with yourself and you win. And you, yeah. it, it's not the distance. It's not the sport. It's do something that's good for you where you don't allow the, that, that why to say, nah, today I don't want to do that why. And for me, when I found that I had a really strong why, I mean, I, I'd move – hell and earth to get it. If I wanted to date that girl, I'd find a way to date that girl. If I wanted to go snow skiing, I'd, I'd save money. I'd get a new pair of skis. I'd go snow, snow skiing. If I wanted to surf on a new surfboard, I'd find a way to get a new surfboard. If I wanted to, mm. when I wanted to go in the military, I found a way. My why could, could not be talked out of me. And yeah. so if you have a why that's strong, then you'll find a reason to do it. If your why is weak, You'll always find an excuse to say, nah, don't do it today. Or it's okay, it won't matter. And we have all of us wrestle with that battle every day. It's a mind battle. And so mm -hmm. for your listeners, um, it's okay that you wrestle with yourself because that's life. I mean, the, the, the chicken's gotta peck himself out of the, the egg, you know? You gotta you gotta work it to have a life. Yeah. And I, you know, to just get practical and bring in the examples of, of where you've applied it in your life and why it is possible. So you, you mentioned that there's a four-step process. You started with the breathing just now. But uh, just, just talk me through, so what Kokora is and, and your involvement there as a result of how you went through it. For your, was it the 66th birthday? You decided to buy yourself a Navy Hell Week, and it cost you a lot of money to, to get shouted and kicked and, and, and tired and full of mud. But, but 30 seconds at a time, just one more push-up, and these four stages, these four steps to get through any challenge, and, and this being a physical and mental exhaustive challenge. You know, what I wanted to do is I, I wanted to do a personal experiment on myself. And the experiment was I want to see if I could grow older and stronger versus older and feeble or over, uh, older and frail. And when I, I've done 12 Ironmans, and when I get out there, I always go to the age group guys, you know, the 65 to 70, the 70 to 75, maybe a 75 to 80. And I say to them, how are you? How are you doing? And they say, you know, I can... 
I can swim, but I can't swim as fast. I can't pull the water like I used to. Or I can mm -hmm. bike, but I can't push the pedal like I used to. Or I run but as fast. So I say, so we, we're going out. We're fading out with, as a senior. And so I wanted to do a personal experiment. Could I get as strong in my 60s as I was in my 20s? And of course, somebody said, no, it's stupid. You know, just be who you are. And so I said, I'm going to do an experiment. And the experiment is I'm going to show up and do five events in seven months, four of which I'll be the oldest person in the world to ever attempt them. And all of them, all the people said, don't do it. That's crazy. You're old. Um, that's just stupid. And this is and not, so, this is not, this is not a, a marathon you're talking about. What type of events are you talking about? Well, the first one was I, I, uh, I went, I did 238 miles across Greece in eight days. And so the remember, remember the movie 300? Yes. We redid that. We went from Sparta to Thermopylae. We redid the legend of King Leonidas after the movie as a Navy oh, wow. SEAL fundraiser for the for our Navy SEAL guys that died in Benghazi with our U.S. ambassador. They all left behind families and kids. And so we wanted to raise money for those families. So we did a, a warrior march, 238 miles in eight days, and redid King Leonidas' thing from the movie 300. We're the only okay. people that ever have ever done it. And it's really stupid. There's a reason why no one's ever done it. it was, you need a stupid one on your resume. That was it. Anyway, I mean, that's going, you know, from the ocean up to ski resorts and down, up and down. So, you know, it's a six hour climb out of Sparta. That's a four hour run downhill, nonstop four hour run. And you pop your big toenails the first day, you know, you lose them just on the downhill run. You have 200 miles to go. Anyway, just stupid stuff. Then the second one was um, there's a lifeguard memorial event here for the lifeguards that have drowned rescuing ocean swimmers. Okay. And so the, the event is we run and swim from one city to another city, 26 miles away. And so you run on the sand and you swim and you run on the rocks and you swim and you run. And so it's a nonstop all day marathon ocean thing. And, you know, I'm wow. the oldest guy by 30 years that have ever tried that thing. And so I showed up with a bunch of kids and they thought I was a parent. <laughs> they go let's all the participants let's get the picture you know so i get in there with the kids and they go you don't belong here the parents are over there i said i'm doing it they go you are <laughs> yeah i think so <laughs> anyway that was a long day and then thirdly it took me three years to train for kokoro and kokoro is that navy seal hell week um and when you do navy seal work when you go to buds and that hell week the psychological breaking point for the young men and um, I don't know, we haven't had a, a woman yet do that. But the psychological breaking point is we go five days with no sleep. And so you go from Sunday night at five o'clock when the guns go off, and that's when all hell breaks loose. And then you go to Friday afternoon at five. And so it's nonstop run, swim, boats, sand, you know, PT, evolutions nonstop. And usually if a kid can make it to Wednesday night, if he can survive mentally to Wednesday night, he'll usually make it to Friday. And why that's a why a 50 hour thing is the is the psychological. Most kids break before the 50 hours. If they can make the 50 hours, they'll make the 72 and the, the 80 hours. So there's a course that was designed for kids who want to go in the Navy to get them ready for Buds and Hell Week. And it's at a thing called Seal Fit. It's a CrossFit gym that was converted to made into a seal fit gym for Navy SEAL training. Same okay. thing, everything is CrossFit, but it's all customized for sand and ocean and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, um, I that's an anaerobic activity. Most people are either aerobic or anaerobic. You know, you're either a marathoner where you keep your heart even all the way the whole time, or you're a sprinter where you jack your heart up. You know, wall balls, box jumps, and running stairs. That, that's anaerobic, aerobic. Most athletes are not both. And so I wanted to see if I could be an anaerobic athlete at my age and do that 50 hours nonstop of running stairs of crabs and pull-ups and push-ups and running up and down mountains and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, <clears throat> I trained for three years to get my body to a place where it felt like I was 20, 25 again. And oh, it was interesting man. that it came back. If I would feed it right and I would exercise it right, uh, my body would begin to grow and I begin to change. And it was my personal experiment to see how I could age and what aging would look like if I would, if I'd work on this thing. Anyway, 
So I became the oldest guy that ever attempted and did uh, seal fit. And now I work there. I work there, all the classes, I'm a volunteer. You can't be an instructor unless you've been a Navy SEAL. But as, mm. as an Air Force PJ guy, they say, oh, we'll let a fly boy in, you know? And so I help them. <laughs> and so I, I'm usually the guy, and the reason I, I talk the way I do is, I usually am the guy that does the autopsies on the people that quit. Okay. So when they finally ring the bell and they say, I'm cooked, I'm done, I quit. I take a clipboard and I take them into the med tent and I say, hey, you know, you did really good. You made five hours or 10 hours or 20 hours or 30 hours or 40 hours. Tell me what's up. And we've been watching them the whole time. And I say, tell me psychologically what's going on in your head. And you find out where they snapped. They just broke. You know, you just see that one moment they just lost that mental control. That negative dialogue got so deep in their heads that they finally mm. just went, Boop. and then you ask them, 20 minutes after they quit, are you glad you quit? They go, no. Yeah. Why'd you quit? Because I broke. Why'd you break? Yeah. I don't know. I just got overwhelmed. I, I just got, I was, I was over, I don't know what to do. I lost it. And so we say, that's a great lesson because now yes. you can go home and train because if you haven't practiced failure, if you haven't yes. practiced hitting the wall, then it's yes. so unusual when you hit it the first time, you think like, Wow, I'm, de I'm dead, but you're not. You have to learn to hit the wall and then back up and do those breathing techniques and then reboot and go hit it again. I mean, I've passed out three times in Ironmans and laid there in the ambulance, you know, comes to get you. And they say, mister, can you see my fingers? You know, and you're laying, there, you know, and you wake up and you go, oh, hi, you know, and we need to take you away in the hospital in an ambulance. I say, okay, stand me up. They stand me up and say, no problem, see ya. And I take off again. <laughs> Why? Why? Because they think just because I hit a wall and I passed out, that's a big deal. But once you get used to passing out, it's not a big deal. You can get up and go again. You just reboot. But most yeah. people have never hit the wall like that. So they freak out you know? mm. and they go, oh, I'm going to die. You're not going to die. You're just miserable. That's all. And, yeah. and you can learn to get through that. Anyway, I did that Kokoro thing. And then three weeks after that, I did my 12th Ironman. And then six weeks after that, I did the 777. All to see if I could get in shape, what kind of a person I could be in my 60s compared to all these kids? I don't mind mm. aging, and I, I don't mind clapping for all those kids, but I want to go, I'm going to clap for me. I want my Super Bowl moment where I say, mm. in my 60s, you know, we can do better. Because I speak a lot to seniors on, you choose how you age. Sure. And I want them to know that, that there's 20, we teach in the teams, there's 20 times more potential in every one of us then we have any idea, but we need someone to bring it out of us. But we yes. don't want to do that because we don't want the pain. And there's pain to grow. There's pain to take on laziness. There's pain to take on, you know, losing weight. There's pain to stop smoking, stop drinking, or whatever your excuse is. There's, there's emotional pain. There's relational pain. There's social pain. There's financial pain. There's physical pain. And people try to get away from pain. But mm. life is full of pain. And you can't grow unless you embrace the suck and hit that pain and go do what you don't want to do. And then you grow. Right. So yeah. when I when I work with adults, I say, you know, um, you can you can have such a better life, but you want to be fat and lazy because you, you don't want to have to have any struggle. And if you don't yeah. struggle, you're going to break your engine in your car. You're never going to change the oil. That's it's going to die on you. You know, 10 years too early. I'll give you this yeah. last thing. Like my dad, I moved home with my dad. You heard yeah. the story, but I moved home with my dad at 91. I said, Dad, no, I, don't, I don't know the story. I don't know. You know this one. So my mom dies at, at 91. My dad's 91. And I say, Dad, what do you what do you want to do? He goes, I want to die at home. I said, OK, die at home. He says, I want you to come live with me. I said, you do? He goes, yeah, I want you to come home and live with me. I said, OK, I'm thinking, how long is he going to live, you know? I mean, I have a life and I'm doing stuff. <laughs> and I go, yeah, he'll live a year, you know, get depressed. Mom's gone. They've been married 65 years, you know. Okay. So the doggone guy lives to 101. So I, so I move home and shut down my life in a sense. I say, okay, dad. But my, my dad is a, is a reader. He's a really smart guy. So the more you sit, the more you lose your thighs. The more they atrophy, right? Okay. So you snooze, you lose. You know, if you just sit all the time. You Quite literally, you snooze, you lose. <laughs> Yeah, you just lose. So my dad has this really nice chair. And it's his chair he's had, I think he's re, he reupholstered it three times he likes the chair so much. You know, you don't touch his, his chair. 
and it's big and you sink way down deep in it. And he crosses his leg, reads the book, you know, but he can't get out of it. And I say, he calls me, hey, I got to go pee. Come get me out of my chair. Hey, I want to eat. Come get me out of the chair. And I finally say, hey, dad, um, I'm taking your chair away from you. And he goes, no, you're not. I said, yeah, I am. You, it's selfish, dad, for you to have to have someone get you out of the chair every time you want to get out of the chair. If you can't get out of your own chair, you can't have the chair. You got to have something to sit in that you can get up on your own. He goes, you're not, I'll kick you out of the house. I said, kick me out of the house. I'm not coming all the time to pick you out of that chair. So he said, well, what are, what are you going to do? I said, get up. So I pick him up, you know, and he has a cane. And so I say, I want you to put both hands on that cane, you know, and I want you to give me a squat. And he gives me this little, bends his back thing, you know. I said, no, no, bend your legs, your hips. You, you can't. He goes, uh, hmm, I can't do that. I said, I know. You sat in that chair so long, you lost your legs. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a regimen. If you want your chair, you're going to have to earn it. <clears throat> he said, what do I got to do? I said, you got to be able to get out of your chair. So I said, I'm going to teach you how to do squats. We call them air squats. So mm-hmm. I want you to put your hands on that cane, and I want you to go down. But I want you to you know, go from the waist, and I want you to keep your back straight and your head up. I can't be looking down, and I want you to go down. Pretty soon he does, he does a real squat, you know, 90 degree bend at the, the knees and stuff. Sweet, Dad. Do some more. Pretty soon, he's doing sets of 20. Wow. So I, got him, so I'm, I get, Dad, it's time for you to get out of that chair. Give me 20. And he'll get out, you know, and he'll, one, two. <laughs> he's going up and down, you know. So I take him down yeah. the street. And I'm walking down the street. My dad's got a hat on, you know. He's the old guy, 95. All the people go, hey, Judge, you know how you're doing, you know. He's on, got his cane. Hey, everybody, you know. I said, hey, Dad, show off. Give me 25 right now. And he stops and holds, puts his arm up the car, you know. <laughs> then gets, puts his hands on the cane. And he goes, one, two, three. He starts doing these squats. These cars come by and go, that's elder abuse. What are you doing to your dad? So he likes the chair. He wants a chair. He's got to earn it. You know, <laughs> people that's just amazing. go, you can't do that to your dad. Anyway, so my dad now doesn't have to ask anybody to get out of the chair. <clears throat> and he's in better shape at 101 when he dies than he was at 91 because I put him on a physical fitness plan, which meant yeah. that there's still more potential in a 91-year-old but he wanted to act 91 and that's fine. You can act 91 if you want, but you don't have to act 91. You can feel better and sleep better and eat better. If you just do what you need to do to make this body function. And Mm. so he thanked me. He said, you know, thanks. I said, I said, what else, you know, your problem. He said, I'm having a problem with my inner ear. I mean, I, I lost my balance. I get up, I'm so wobbly, you know, and I have to hold the wall. I said, okay. So I give him a ping pong paddle. And I say, can you take this ball and go bang, 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 bang? And he goes, yeah, you know, he does that thing, you know, he gets pretty good at it. I say, can you do your left hand? He does that thing, you know. Go, okay. Now I want you to lift one foot up. And you lift the foot up, do it on one foot. And that's the problem, you know. He's he's trying to do this thing, you know. After a couple of weeks, he's got that down, you know, left foot, right foot, <laughs> left foot. Then I say to my dad, okay, dad, now I want you to go out to the side. Can you do that on one foot? And then come back on one foot, and then you can go this way on one foot, and then switch feet. And all of a sudden, his balance comes back, his inner ear, and all of a sudden, he's not wobbling all over the place when he gets out of the chair because it comes back. There's still more potential, but we just think with age or whatever, this is the way it's always been, or this is the way my family's always been, or, you know, my history, or, you know, this is what we do. And I have all these people from South America that, that write me, and they say, don't you know that when, when a South American – gets 50, they just expect to die. Yeah. You just eat and sit and get fat and play with the grandkids and your life is over. And they write me and say, when we play your videos down here, people can't believe that you're living your life and and being fit and active because all our culture teaches is when you get to a certain age, just lay down and it's, it's, Inevitable. You're just screwed up. You're just going to go out with heart disease or blood pressure or something like that. And there's cultures out there that if you can change the pattern of the culture, they can they can live differently. Anyway, all of us have cultures. You have cultures there. There's a different culture in East London than there is in Joburg. You know, there's a different culture in Pretoria than there is in Bloemfontein. There's a, there's and if you can get different cultures, ethnic groups, culture stuff to change, um, people can live different kinds of lives. So, that's amazing. 
And, and what a what a great story for my dad to be joining us. So, Robert, uh, three times I'm a week. Sorry, swimming. Dad. Sorry, Dad. I forgot you were watching. <laughs> no, that's great because now like, the challenge is there in real time. Dad, <laughs> you you're gonna have to up your swimming three times a week. Has to be six times a week. One k has to be one and a half k. Oh my so here God. we go. Sorry. Challenge accepted. <laughs> I repent. I repent. I shouldn't have gone on all that. No, that's awesome. And um, you know. I, there's so many more things I want to talk about. I did ask you for an hour, and if you've got to go, you've got to go. But if, if I can ask you a few more questions, I'd be grateful. I'll come back to another episode. <laughs> let me just, before you do that, let me, say, let me say hi to Gareth Stead. Let me say hi to Willem the Toot, your friend. Let me say hi yep. to Nils down there in Stellenbosch. Let me say hi to Carvin in uh, Vindhook. Let me say hi to uh, Bill Bennett in uh, Cape Town. Oh. I have all kinds of friends. I, you know, I've been there 15 times. I love your country, and I can't wait to get back. And someday I'll get back and see all, and then, all yeah. the friends. Get back speaking. And then we'll, yeah, that'll be great. And then we can get to meet up and maybe go for a run and a swim together. That'll be amazing. I yeah, can't keep up uh, with you. <laughs> it's been a it's been a wonderful conversation, and I wanted to just uh, uh, sort of finish off with a, a bit of a shared story, and then uh, how you you bring it into bite-sized chunks to just round off the, the sort of message of uh, incremental gains, etc. I can remember clearly when I joined the South African Air Force, basic military training, and obviously that's embrace the suck. That's where you know that's the bottom line. Embrace the suck. It doesn't matter what you do. It's never good enough, fast enough, high enough, clean enough, and uh, you're not going to sleep enough. You're not going to eat enough. All those things. You you're designed to be pushed out of your comfort zone as well as getting fit. And I can remember clearly thinking, at times, leopard crawling through the mud or, uh, you know, on the parade ground in the gravel for a third hour and, and thinking, this is just awful. But quite easily, uh, turning it, sort of turning a mirror on it and looking at it myself inside and saying, if there ever has been an Air Force pilot to uh, qualify before and go through what I'm going through, if someone has ever done it and finished it, then I can too. And what if it's going to take this extra half an hour or a bit more leopard calling, a bit more running or a bit more no sleep, then that's what I'm going to do. But if someone's done it before me, then sure as hell, I can also do it. Correct. Yeah. And the, the, yeah, so the, the message there for, for uh, um, you know, this incremental gains and you say just one more push up, one more second. Don't look at the, the end goal. Don't look at the that 228 miles you got to run can you just run one more mile or one more minute of one more mile let me I think yeah, yeah, yeah we, we go our four things that we teach our, our special ops guys number one nasal breathing and you can go online youtube mark divine unbeatable mind on box breathing that's a whole okay. other topic number two is mini goals micro goals mini goals i can't do 50 hours but i can do the next five minutes and the, what we say and we teach the kids is just stay in the moment. Can you do the moment? Well, I can mm -hmm. do the moment. I can do right now. I don't know if I can do five minutes from now, but I can do right now. Well, then just do right now. And then after you do that, can you do right now again? And pretty soon you break that elephant. How do you eat it? You know, one bite at a time. You, you break that huge 50 hours or two weeks or whatever it is into each moment every day with mental discipline of staying in the moment. And I can do the moment. When we got done with Kokoro, our instructor, Navy SEAL Commander Mark Devine, he looked at us and said, how many of you guys would do another day with me? So we just did 50 hours nonstop or a mess. And we looked at each other, you know, and we said, we can do another day with you. And it's because we were miserable the first hour. Yeah. We were miserable the 40th hour. We were miserable the 50th hour. And once you learn to do the moment, Mm. You can do the next moment, the next moment, the next moment, and the next moment. If it's another day, I'll just stay in another set of moments till the next day is done. I don't like any of it. But the mental discipline of many goals, breaking that big problem puzzle down into a, a, a workable thing, you can do that. Number three, visualization. We see ourselves mm. finishing. We, see, we, have a, we have a picture in our mind of not quitting, of winning. And there's something inside you that you see the win and nothing can take that away from you because you're staying in the moment because you see that thing in front of you. And then thirdly is positive self-talk. And so we rewire our brains by talking positive out loud to ourselves. And so when I'm doing seven marathons, I'm talking to myself in my head. When I'm doing Kokoro, I'm talking to myself, easy day, piece of cake, no problem. I paid money for this. I love I this. Be 
I want to be here versus, oh my God, I'm dying. I'm, I'm not going to make it. I break that negativity. And when you, when you breathe and break that negative thing in your head, then bring in positive self-talk, you can reboot yourself into that positive place. I love the rain. I love the mud. I love the cold. What's the problem? It's a challenge. It's a, you know, I, you know, I could do another five minutes of this or whatever. And you break that thing down. So it's nasal breathing, mini goals, visualization, positive self-talk. We do that all day long, whether we're, I do it today. When I turn this thing off with you, I'm going to be back in my four things again today, reboot and get ready to go. So, um, it, it's, it's manageable life, you know, you're not going to be with your boss forever. You know, you're not going to be stuck in this situation forever. Mm. Don't, don't allow yourself to be overwhelmed emotionally. Work with your mind, put it into pieces, put it in perspective, and you'll suffer, but you'll get through it. It's funny to me how the same pressure that makes one couple really close is the same yeah. pressure that blows another couple up. Mm. Yeah. You have an autistic child. You have a special needs child. It either draws the couple close or blows it up. And so pressure is what reveals to you who you are. Yes. And so I don't know I, I don't know anyone until I watch them under pressure because that's when they morph. That's when the real person comes out and they change under pressure. Mm. So that's why we put so much pressure on young people because we know what they're like when they're normal. But what are they like in combat? What are they like when they've been chased by the Taliban for three days? What are they like when... They have to take care of their teammates and there's blood everywhere and, and they've been shot. You know, what do you like under pressure? So we bring pressure for them to discover who they are as well as we get to discover who they are too. So we need to know. And, and your viewers need to know who they are and they may not like who they are in everything, but they can change that. They can work on it, but mm. they need someone to, to walk with them most of the time because it's painful. Someone to say, you can do it. Look me in the eyes. You can do this. You can do this. One, one story you'll like. I'm in Air Force Special Warfare, and there's a big six-foot-five guy. And we've um, done all day in mud, mud PT in the heat. And so these guys were miserable. We've been going since four in the morning. And four in the afternoon, we finally get done with them, and we bring them in. And they've screwed up all day. And so the instructor, of course, said, you can't do, can't do anything right. What's wrong with you? Blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. He says, you owe me 350 burpees before dinner and everybody just looks at the start to like 350 burpees before dinner in these wet boots and wet pants and wet shirt yeah well they take a hose they spray them down again to make them more wet they say i need 350 before you eat get them done and this big tall kid's there and he's really good in everything but burpees because tall people don't do burpees real well you know <laughs> the little guys love burpees but they don't have to go so far but the big tall he's six three six four you know Anyway, he's in the back and he can't keep up. And so, of course, the instructor brings him to the front and says, lead everybody. And he goes, me? Yeah, you. Or quit. And so he says, okay. So he starts leading this thing, you know, give me five. And he's, he's dying. Pretty soon, he's not even opening his eyes. Pretty soon, the snot's coming out of his nose. And he's crying. Mm -hmm. you know, at 200 burpees, he's out of it. He's, he's lost it. So I say to the instructor, can I have him? And he goes, yeah, sure. So I say, open your, open your eyes. And he looks at me, you know, and I go, you can do this, breathe. You can do this, say that. I can do this. Now give me five. Everybody, let's go, five. Close his eyes, snot, drool, just dying. Now give me 10, breathe. Look at me, I can do this. We did that all the way through 350. Yeah, and he he lost it. I mean, he's crapping in his pants. He was he was crying in front of all of his teammates. He he was physically beyond anything that he ever encountered. And so at the end, his class clapped for him. And then they went and had dinner. I said, after dinner, I'll meet you guys at 1750 in the office. I'll be talking to you guys. So they all get cleaned up, you know. And I go in there and I say, hey, um, how's everybody doing? You know, glad you guys got 350 done. <clears throat> Hey, uh, you, stand up. And so the guy stands up and I said, I'm really proud of you. You really did well. And he starts to cry in front of the whole class and says, that was the greatest moment of my life. 
Yeah. And I said, why? He said, because I didn't know I had that in me. I didn't know mm -hmm. I could do that. I, I, was, I was out of my mind. I said, and now he goes, I just can do more than I ever thought I could do. He said, thank mm -hmm. you. And I said, I'm proud of you. We're proud of you. And I said to all the other students, I said, we want to do the same thing to every one of you because you have a weakness too. Yours may not be burpees. Yours may be the run or the swim or this, but we're going to break every one of you because you need to have that moment where you overcome yourself and you find out that you're smarter or gifted. You can do that gravel thing that you were talking about. You, you can do that. Don't give up on yourself. And when that, when somebody says to you, that's the greatest moment of my life. You think yeah, that guy's had a win. I mean, that mm. guy had an epiphany and he went on and he graduated, you know, but he, he had that doubt, which we all have. So for the listeners, you all have doubts. You all have fears. You all have issues. We're all screwed up. And if you'll look in the mirror and work on your stuff and say, I'm going to grow, I'm going to change. I'm not going to, I don't care if my mom and dad did that and their parents did that. I'm going to change. You know, I, I'm not going to be the victim. I'm not going to stay this or stay that. And you, you call up Alex and you say, Alex, I want you to hold me accountable. <laughs> you know, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. You, you'll see that people will get these wins because they just didn't know that they're that smart and that gifted and that pretty and that, that able. I mean, I went to university five times. Five. Uh, the first four times, I was a mess in my head. When I went back after the military, let's study. And you get your A's and you knock that thing out. I'm not stupid. I just was lazy in my brain. I was, I was wired wrong. And you have to cut the wires in your brain and learn how to think right. And then everything becomes easier. You, you take it from going from being average to beyond average. And uh, the, the same title of your new book, and maybe if you've got it there, you can just uh, show. And Robert, amazing, amazing and inspiring talk with you today. Thank you so much. Beyond average. Yeah, as you says, said, you always used to think you were average. Yeah, I was, I've never won anything. <laughs> I was never, everybody was better than me. Everybody was better than me in everything until I learned to focus and forget about them and just do what I can do and focus and discipline. Then they all quit and I was left standing. And that taught me just do what I can do. And then all of a sudden I can go beyond average because I felt like an average guy. And I, liked, mm -hmm. I didn't want to be mediocre. I didn't know how to get out of it though. I didn't, know how to, I didn't know how to change until so people grabbed me and said, do that. This book is better than the audio book, though, because I narrate it. I'm like this. I'm laughing and stuff. I'll hold on to the whole book. <laughs> anyway, if you want to get to Amazon, it's, it's developing yourself through the 20X principle. There's 20 times more potential in our kids and our middle-aged folks and our, our seniors. There's 20 <laughs> times you. more potential in everybody, it, but they need someone to help them bring it out. That's amazing. Robert, amazing, amazing. Great time talking with you today. Thank you so much for your time, getting up super early before the crack of dawn. Wonderful. And where else can they find you on social or websites or anywhere else? My, um, what is my web? My website is my name, Robert, <laughs> I can't remember what it is, roberthamiltonowens.com. Awesome. My middle name, I don't know why my mom named me Hamilton. Robert, Hamilton. <laughs> she said it sounded stately. I said you were trying to speak something into existence, I'm sure. <laughs> Open it up. <laughs> robertHamiltonOwens.com, and I can't wait to get back to South Africa sometime and, and uh, see everybody. It'll be a treat that we can go and share a meal together. That'll be wonderful. Thank you, thank and you, I'll, thank and you. I'll, and I'll watch you go run. <laughs> yeah, that'll be wonderful too. Robert, thanks for your time. It's been wonderful. Thanks for the, your comments and your the, the questions, everybody too. And please stay tuned. We will be bringing you more. And if, uh, until next and time. If, if they want to write me, my, my email address is Robert Owens. My name, Robert Owens, but it has, Owens has two S's. Robert okay. Owens with two S's, because Robert Owens was gone. Robert Owens <laughs> with two S's at Yahoo. And they can Perfect. write me, and I'll, I'll be happy to communicate with them and talk to them. And that's very kind of you. Thank you so much, and thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Have a great day. Cheers.